Hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Can someone just give me a comment that you are hearing and seeing us? All good. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, welcome everyone to Arctic Net Student Association's first webinar. Um, we are doing a webinar series, and this new series is going to be aimed at um, post-grad life. So most of us are grad students and we wanna know what kinds of things are available to us after we finish grad school. And we do have quite a few people lined up um, in all the different sectors. We got private sector, today we have government sector. So we're gonna have uh, more seminars lined up for you guys. We're probably gonna do about once a month, but we will update everyone on our socials which I, we will have up at the end of this presentation. So if you um, want to find out about the upcoming seminars, you will find those on all of our socials, on Twitter, on Facebook. And we're trying to figure out our listserv right now for email, um, but we'll let you know on all the socials. And um, I just want to welcome everybody. And if you have any questions about um, how to use this platform, uh, Danny's just going to quick, quickly say a couple of things, and Danny's also going to introduce um, Les Harris, who is today's speaker, and we want to welcome everyone, and we hope you have a good uh, experience here. Feel free to chat away, but I'm going to let Danny take over now. Okay, we're just going to get this up and running real quick. Les, if you could put up your awesome presentation. So you want me to share my screen right now? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Share screen. Do that one. There. Cool. I can just, yeah, I'm just going to quickly introduce Les. So my name is Danny and I'm the English Communications Officer on the Arctic Net Student Committee. Um, I'm going to be your moderator tonight. So just quickly to acquaint everyone with Crowdcast. I'm sure you've all noticed already on the right hand side, you can type stuff, you can ask questions. So feel free to do that. Um, please keep it G rated, like all the usual, be respectful. Um, and then at the very bottom, you can also click ask a question. Um, so I will be checking those and, but, but we won't be, Les won't be answering the questions until the very end. So the presentation is about 45 minutes long, and then there should be about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, but we are gonna be ending at 8 p.m. sharp. So tonight I have the pleasure of introducing Les Harris, who is also an Arctic fisheries research biologist working with the Arctic Aquatic Research Division within the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. He has 16 years of Arctic field experience studying the evolutionary ecology and behavior of anandromous and freshwater fishes. He has worked in communities in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories, including 11 field seasons directly studying Arctic char and lake trout in the Cambridge Bay area. In Cambridge Bay, he has worked closely with the community and that has resulted in more than 30 beneficiaries that have been hired over that time. He has published over 30 research articles on the evolutionary ecology, biology, and management of freshwater and anadromous fresh fish species. He was also instrumental in the development of the Integrative Fisheries Management Plan for the Cambridge Bay Arctic Char Commercial Fishery, which is the first of its kind for this species in Canada. So tonight we're going to hear about the pathways Les chose that resulted in his current position with the DFO and about some of the research he's been up to. So let's take it away. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Danny. And I threw up this fake slide because I, I thought it'd be hilarious if Danny tried to read the whole thing when introducing me, but that kind of failed miserably. So uh, uh, good evening, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, and as Danny mentioned, my name is Les Harris, and I'm a research biologist in the stock assessment group here in Winnipeg with Fisheries and Oceans. And I first want to thank uh, the organizers, Enu and Danny, for this opportunity tonight. I feel really honored, and it's, and it's quite awesome that I get to kick off this uh, pretty cool webinar series. And so since I have roughly about 45 minutes, I just want to take the beginning part of this talk to tell a little bit of a story 
basically about a kid who grew up fishing, decided to pursue some fishy stuff for school, ended up in grad school and finally landed in Winnipeg as a fisheries biologist. So I'll, I'll highlight a, a few lucky choices or things that happened along the way that allowed me to land in Winnipeg. And I think about this stuff a lot, almost like the, the butterfly effect. What would have happened if I zigged instead of zagged at this point or chose A instead of B? Where would I be? It's, it's kind of crazy to think about how life turns out. And within there, I'll highlight some of the research that I've been involved with, including several different systems across the Arctic and spanning multiple species, all within Salmonine that I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to work on. But I'll start with some acknowledgements here uh, to recognize people that have been instrumental in much of the work that I'm presently doing, starting with my uh, master's advisor at UBC, Rick Taylor, who I still get to work very closely with, a research scientist at DFO here in Winnipeg, Jim Reist and Ross Tallman. And I'll admit I had to steal these pictures off the internet because uh, the only picture I had of Jim was actually this awesome picture of when he donated his hair for a charity. I'll next introduce or acknowledge my good friend Rob Bajno, who really knows all things technical when it comes to the genetics lab. Uh, and he's been nice enough and kind enough to allow me to work in his lab for a few years. And I also didn't have a picture of Rob, uh, so luckily a friend sent me this last night, but I tried to Google will image it and literally when you look up Rob Bajno, this is the ninth image that comes up which is pretty awesome and so finally I need to give a huge shout out to a dear friend and collaborator JS Moore uh, we've been collaborating on char related stuff now for uh, pretty much a decade and we've known each other since grad school and even though he's a fancy pants professor at uh, University of Laval now Jess will always be this guy to me let me put my finger in his belly when we're feeling pretty blue and I'll acknowledge other people along the way as well. So I was born in Lethbridge, Alberta, and I grew up fishing. And some of the earliest childhood memories I have are actually sitting on my grandpa's lap, holding his ice fishing rod, fishing for trout in the mountains. As I grew, so did my passion for fishing, lake fishing, river fishing, ice fishing, fly fishing, you name it, as long as there's a rod in my hand, I was pretty happy. In junior high, I moved to a small town called Barhead, Alberta, or called Barhead, in Alberta, not too far from Edmonton. And my love for fishing still remained, but I kind of switched to more cool water species like pike, perch, and walleye instead of chasing those mountain trout. Uh, getting closer to graduating high school, I realized it was about time for me to figure out what the heck I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to go. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do, except that I wanted to work with fish. And as a young kid, I think when you want to work with fish, you always just picture yourself being a conservation officer or a fishery officer. I didn't know what a biologist or a research scientist was, that's for sure. So then one day a buddy of mine in high school showed me the course calendar for the renewable resource option in the biological science program at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. I opened up that course calendar, saw a few fish related courses, and that coupled with the, uh, the amount of cool field-based coursework that was in that program had me sold and I started at Nate that fall. Nate was an absolutely wonderful program and I had an amazing opportunity there. And I graduated from Nate in 1999. And that summer I was extremely lucky and fortunate enough to land a job with the Alberta Conservation Association. I actually turned down a job guiding in Northern Alberta on Lake Athabasca to take this position. And with the ACA, they were essentially looking for someone that could do creel surveys and do a bunch of test angling. So using a rod and reel to capture uh, fish and then biologically sample them and I could definitely do that So I worked for the ACA for three summers and two falls where I gained a wealth of experience uh, Fisheries experience everything from creel surveys to sampling fish and processing fish to uh, aging of variety fish And it was an amazing opportunity that I'm indebted to a biologist named Bill Patterson for for giving me that opportunity so after graduating from Nate Essentially, everyone in my class either goes to the University of Alberta or the University of Lethbridge because they offered really good transfer credits coming from Nate. I decided to apply to go to the latter just because I still had family in the area. And as far as I knew, that fall, I would be starting the environmental science program in Lethbridge. That summer, however, I met and worked with, and still to this day, he's one of my really dear friends, Mark Feldberg, who changed my academic trajectory. 
he told me about a relatively new school that I had never heard of called the University of Northern British Columbia that had a natural resource program, a uh, natural resource management program with a major in fisheries management. And poof, that was all I needed to hear. I was sold and I was going to start that program. So I applied and was starting in the winter and uh, headed to UMBC with Mark. And, and this is one of those things or one of those times when I have to think about what the heck would have happened if I took the job on Lake Athabasca or if I never met Mark or what would my life look like if I actually went to University of Lethbridge. And so it's, it's kind of crazy to think about those things. During my undergrad, I continued to work for the Alberta Conservation Association, and I did uh, summer forestry work as well in the uh, Prince George area. But upon completion of my, uh, my undergrad at UMBC, I was offered a job in Inuvik as a fisheries biologist for the Gwich'in Renewable Resource Board. I uh, looked at the pictures on the GRB website and assumed that Inuvik was going to be nestled right in, the, right in the Richardson Mountains, kind of akin to a Swiss town in the Alps. It was not the case, it was close, but I definitely, I loved my time in Inuvik and I often think about those times fondly. And it, uh, it gave me my first real taste of Arctic field experience. And once I was in Inuvik, I spent much of my time focused on trying to capture Arctic, or capture char, sorry, capture whitefish in this lake called Travian Lake within the Gwich'in settlement area. I was tagging fish in there and collecting samples for uh, looking at population characteristics. Primary species include lake whitefish and broad whitefish, and the latter was more important from a, a subsistence perspective, but also really cool because there were two distinct life history types that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But through my sampling of lake whitefish at Travian Lake, I noticed that fish were either jam-packed with sticklebacks or jam-packed with invertebra invertebrates, primarily by bivalves. And I thought to myself, well, that's super cool, but didn't think much of it other than well, I wonder what could be driving this. And that is really cool. Until I came across this seminal paper from the Bernaches lab um, that discussed the molecular genetics of lake whitefish species pairs. And in that paper, they said the ecotypes differed more importantly in their trophic use. A strong dichotomy between adults of both ecotypes was observed in both lakes in a predicted manner. Dwarf fish fed almost exclusively on zooplankton, and zoobenthos and fish preys dominate the diet of normal adult fish. And let me point out that I had no idea what the heck molecular genetics was or population genetics or an adaptive radiation, but I thought it was really fascinating that diets differed between these species and that they spent substantial amount of time talking about how genetically different they were, although I really didn't understand what that meant yet. So, but that got me thinking about these lacustrine or lake form broad whitefish and anatomous broad whitefish in the lower Mackenzie River system, where considerable effort had been put into understanding if these were discrete demographically independent stocks. So lacustrine stocks were found in the Travian Lake system that I was working in, and anadromous stocks in the Mackenzie River and its tributaries. They could be differentiated based on life history traits, but uh, whether they were demographically independent was still unclear based on a bunch of other methods. So after reading Louis's paper, I was like, oh, interesting. Maybe this genetic stuff could help. I had no idea really what that meant or where I was going to go, but I knew I kind of wanted to go to the coast. And so I decided to apply to grad school. My first email was to a professor at the University of British Columbia named Mike Healy, who was actually just about to retire. He was on his way out. So he forwarded my email that included a small proposal to Rick Taylor, who was aforementioned here at the beginning of my talk. Rick was very interested, so I applied for um, grad school and uh, was accepted and starting that fall. And I just want to give a shout out for Rick as being one of the best ranters that the world has ever known. And if you ever have the opportunity to hear him get going, I highly recommend it. It's, it's very entertaining. So once I started at UBC, and definitely not an aesthetically unpleasing place to go to school, that's for sure, it didn't take me long to become interested in the factors that influence the distribution of genetic variation and population structure. This stuff was all brand new to me, but I, I really did find it quite interesting. And while there, there was one strategic thing that I did, and I invited the aforementioned Ross Tallman to serve on my committee. Ross had published some of those earlier 
papers I was mentioning about broad whitefish, and he was currently a research scientist and the section head of the stock assessment group here in Winnipeg. So I thought this could be a pretty good career move to have someone like that aligned with me and to serve on my committee. I finished in 2008 at UBC, and luckily at the exact same time, there was a job that opened up in Winnipeg and Ross encouraged me to apply. So I ended up applying and in March of 2009, I was on my way to Winnipeg. And this was literally one of the hardest decisions that I've ever had to make, uh, was leaving Vancouver to go to Winnipeg. I loved the coast, I loved the mountains, I loved Vancouver and I loved what I was doing at the time. And at that time I was in a term position working at the DFO West Vancouver Laboratories for probably one of the nicest and smartest humans I've ever known. And that was a research scientist named uh, Robert or Bob Devlin. And I really do have him to thank for my move to Winnipeg. He told me that if I did not take this indeterminate position, that he would not rehire me. And of course he was kidding, but what he really stressed to me was the importance of getting your foot in the door with DFO and it didn't matter where you ended up. That doesn't have to be your forever home. Well, anyways, it's been over 11 years now and I'm still in Winnipeg and I, I still think it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. Ross is still my supervisor and I still get to do some cool stuff studying Arctic populations of fishes. I'm still generally interested in, in the evolutionary ecology and population genetic side of things, but now I sort of use a variety of different methods and by me, I mean my collaborators uh, to sort of understand anadromous cell monids in the Arctic better. And this is where I'll kind of start bringing in uh, some of the science and background of what I do. So why do we study fishes? Well, for me, they're just really, really darn cool. In particular, they demonstrate extensive, extensive polymorphism in morphology and resource use in both freshwater and marine environments from the tropics to the Arctic. These ecological or morph morphological variants are commonly known as morphotypes or ecotypes or ecomorphs. And often these polymorphisms occur as discrete morphological and behavioral forms that specialize on alternative resource types in distinct habitats. And examples, and everyone's probably heard these thrown around, are pelagic, benthic, limnetic, piscivorous, and insectivorous type morphotypes or, or ecotypes. And given this immense variability and the often rapid evolution of this variation, fishes have provided ideal systems with which to study the evolution of ecological and morphological variation. And one of the most striking examples of this in Salmonid is the exist four distinct morphs of Arctic char in Iceland's Lake Thingvallavatn. So generally we're interested in studying the genetic diversity, which is the natural variation in alleles and genotypes within and between individuals and populations. And it's important for several reasons. First, evolution um, is required. So uh, genetic diversity is required for evolution. And therefore, the genetic diversity within a population reflects their ability to adapt to environmental change. You essentially need variation to arise, and then you need some of those variants to be more fit than others. Uh, second, genetic diversity is important for fitness. So for example, in naturally outbreeding populations, the loss of genetic diversity is often related to inbreeding, which can greatly reduce reproductive fitness. So as such, it's important to try to resolve patterns of genetic variation in natural populations and understand which forces are responsible for promoting or decreasing variation. So mutation is the ultimate cause, but it's also influenced by forces such as gene flow drift and selection. And I'll talk about a couple of these in more detail. So given the recent colonization of most of the Arctic habitats by fishes, the predominant forces influence genetic variation in these systems are gonna be gene flow and genetic drift. Although in the world of genomics, we are starting to understand a bit better the role of selection through looking at things like outlier loci. So gene flow is the movement of genes among populations, and it's a homogenizing force that constrains population differences in, in, the, in the meantime. It often proceeds asymmetrically because of things like uh, sex bias dispersal or source sync population dynamics. And when it does occur asymmetrically, that can be important for maintaining population persistence in some of these small peripheral and sometimes endangered populations. 
when gene flow is restricted or absence, divergence among populations is primarily driven by genetic drift. And this is a change in allele frequencies from generation to generation, just due to random sampling. It's influenced highly by the effective size of the population, which is the size of the idealized population that experiences drift at the same rate as the population under study. And the idealized population is just this population that conforms to these theoretical assumptions, such as infinite population size, a completely random mating, not subjected to these forces that I was talking about. But as I mentioned, gene flow acts to counteract drift and also has several important implications for fitness or otherwise lifetime reproductive success. So gene flow or dispersal allows for the colonization of new habitats. And this is especially important in Arctic Canada, where a lot of these habitats became available just after the last glaciation. It helps avoid aiding depression and competition among uh, kin, and it acts as a bet hedging strategy in unpredictable environments. And I'll expand on that a little bit later with one of our studies. Of course, however, there are negative consequences to, to moving around in gene flow. So you risk not finding a suitable habitat or mate. It compromises local adaptation. And when you move from point A to point B, it takes energy and it could increase your chance to predation. But really we're interested in understanding how this force operates in natural systems. But when thinking about the evolutionary ecology of Arctic fishes, we really have to keep in mind that this is what the continent looked like about 18,000 years ago. So during the Pleistocene, much of Canada was covered in glaciers and these historical events had a profound impact on the current structuring of genetic variation for most populations. Fish were particularly impacted as opportunities for dispersal were limited to these direct water connections. They either perished or they became isolated in refugia. And for Canadian fish species, there were about six main refugia and several smaller subrefugia uh, in which they were able to survive. So as evolutionary ecologists, we have these keen interests in teasing apart the historical versus contemporary factors and how that's shaped present day structuring. And the historical factors, as I mentioned, primarily relate to isolation in and dispersal from this glacial refugia, including the sizes of the populations that were able to colonize areas that uh, they currently reside. So larger populations, of course, being less influenced by genetic drift. And there really is an entire field uh, called phylogeography devoted to studying this but it's cool because there are several predictions that can be made regarding genetic diversity of fishes from glaciated versus non-glaciated glaciated areas. So first fish from glaciated areas should have lower levels of genetic diversity than those from unglaciated, area, unglaciated areas. And as you move further away from the glacial refuge, you should see a progressive decline in genetic diversity, typically related to founder events and bottlenecks with post-glacial dispersal. They should have larger range sizes because they had access to these huge post-glacial lakes for dispersal. Um, there should be phylogenetic groupings based on the glacial refuge they lived in. And often they're not in migration drift equilibrium because they just haven't been there long enough. But of course, there are a lot of contemporary factors that influence present day structure. And these include, well, what's happening with gene flow now? Are there barriers to dispersal or environmental features that restrict gene flow and promote differentiation. What is going on with ecology and life history type? For example, anadromous versus resident forms. What is the current population demography? So how big are they? Because smaller populations will be more prone to the eroding effects of genetic drift. And of course, there are biological attributes such as uh, uh, generation times and timing of reproduction. So all this background to say, is that as evolutionary ecologists and those that do population genetics, we're generally interested in teasing apart how these historical and contemporary factors influence genetic diversity and population structuring, and in particular, how gene flow has helped shape this present day structuring. So my background after finishing at UBC was really in the evolutionary ecology and population genetics, and it, it still is, um, but it's, it's hard to keep up with a field that you're not completely immersed in. 
And so now my research has sort of evolved to include a variety of different methods, collaborating with lots of different people to understand Arctic salmonids better. And then, of course, we always want to try to relate our findings to conservation or fisheries management. Why are we doing this work? Uh, why is it important? And so now I'd like to just highlight uh, for the last part of this talk, a few of our recent studies where we've uh, used genetics or genomics and telemetry to look at some of this stuff. So I almost exclusively focus on species that are of commercial and subsistence importance. And I've been uh, fortunate enough and have had the opportunity to work in some pretty cool systems and study some pretty interesting species such as Lake Trout, Arctic Char, and Dolly Varden. But in the interest of time and for this talk today, I'd like to highlight some of our work on lake trout from Great Bear Lake, and then uh, I'll finish up with some work on Arctic char in the Cambridge Bay region of Nunavut. So Great Bear Lake work that I was fortunate enough to get involved in was initiated by Kim Howland, a research scientist at DFO, and Louise Chavary, who really started diving into understanding Great Bear Lake lake trout as part of her PhD. And for those of you who don't know Louise, she is probably one of the funnest humans that you'll ever encounter. And I truly hope for everyone's sake who is watching this or will see this later, that they get to experience a conference with Louise, like an in-person conference. It's pretty wild. So Great Bear Lake is located in the Northwest Territories and it is the largest lake in our country. And it was uh, undoubtedly impacted by these glaciation events that I was talking about. So as uh, Laurentian and Cordillera, Cordillera and ice sheets retreated, Numerous huge glacial lakes were formed, including Lake Agassiz and McConnell that covered where present day Great Bear Lake, Great Slave Lake, and uh, Lake Athabasca are. Um, and these are essentially shown here in the gray shaded areas on the, uh, the map of Canada. This lake lasted till about 8,500 years ago when isostatic rebounds separated these lakes. And now Great Bear Lake is divided into five distinct arms that are connected to a central basin. Although species diversity is relatively low in these systems, these events provided unprecedented ecological opportunity and had a hand in promoting the morphological variation among lake trout forms that we see today in this system. So initially, Blackie et al. showed that lake trout characterized as piscivores or insectivores based on diet were different in morphological traits, primarily related to uh, jaw characteristics. Alfonso followed this up with and resolved a couple of forms that he referred to as these redfin or normal char that were also morphologically distinct based on body and caudal peduncle shape. And then Louise really, really dove into this when she used a suite of morphological measurements to resolve four distinct shallow water morphs that she referred to as groups one to group four. And this is cool because this is equaling or exceeding the diversity of that scene in the Laurentian Great Lakes, but without attributing that to, to depth. So the levels of ecological and genetic differences among these shallow water forms and where they came from really was still unknown, and that's what we wanted to explore. And previously, it was assumed that these fish came into Great Bear Lake from the Beringian Refuge. But where sympatric morphotypes exist, there are several hypotheses that can explain their nature and origin. First, and perhaps the most fundamental, is that ecotypes within one locality represent a genetically discrete population and are not plastic responses to a heterogeneous environment. And the most direct test of this would be uh, multi-generational breeding or common gardening experiments. But you can also assess genetic distinctiveness at uh, neutral markers to see if these ecotypes represent distinct gene pools. If they do, then a second fundamental hypothesis concerns the geography and origin of these ecotypes. For example, whether they evolved in allopatry and now exist in sympatry following secondary contact, or whether they actually did evolve in sympatry. So we wanted to explore these questions for, for Great Bear Lake. We wanted to look at the genetics of the different morphotypes of lake trout, try to see what their genetic relationships were, if they were different, and then see potentially how they came to that system and ended up uh, evolving into the forms that we see today. And so we did this using microsatellite markers and mitochondrial DNA. And we put some hypotheses uh, forward for explaining this divergent. Divergence. And under the allopatric model, 
we would expect that similar morphs found in these different arms within Great Bear Lake would be most closely related to each other than divergent morphs from the same arm. And that each of these morph clusters should be have a genetic affinity to one of the glacial refugia that I mentioned previously. Alternatively, under this intra lacustrine model of divergence, distinct lake trout morphs within Great Bear Lake should be more genetically similar to each other than to any lake trout from outside of this system. And this scenario would suggest that lake trout morphs in Great Bear Lake diverge from a common ancestor in situ uh, soon after colonizing the system and then disperse to occupy each of the arms today. And finally, it's also possible that you have multiple repeated occurrences of this divergence happening in each arm. So for this, we included samples from each of the arms in Great Bear Lake and each of the morphotypes and putative uh, glacial refugial locations outside of this system where they may have uh, post-glacially colonized from. So among samples, we found that estimates of FST, which is a measure of genetic differentiation, was highly variable, ranging from zero to essentially no differentiation between some samples in Great Bear Lake to 0 0.44, which is pretty high. And this is among different lakes representative of different glacial lineages. And when we grouped all Great Bear Lake samples together, they were much more closely related to the Mississippian grouping than any other refuge. A factorial correspondence analysis, which groups individuals based on their multi-locus genotype, revealed some pretty interesting findings as well. So first, all Great Bear Lake samples clearly grouped together with samples from a putative Mississippian lineage. And divergent morphs within Great Bear Lake were not associated with any of the different samples representing other glacial refugia. A second, similar morphs within Great Bear Lake also grouped together and separate from other morphs, regardless of the arm that they were sampled in. So to put this another way, similar morphs across arms were more genetically similar than they were to a divergent morph from the same arm. So we did some Bayesian clustering as implemented in the program structure, and this revealed some similar results, suggesting the presence of nine clusters or genetic groups. And really what this is, is a Bayesian analysis that tries to identify genetic groups or clusters by grouping individuals in a way that will minimize departures from Hardy-Weinberg and linkage disequilibrium. So there appears to be some groupings by glacial refugia here. And Great Bear Lake clearly shows a genetic affinity to Great Slave Lake and Nipigon samples that are presumed to harbor fish from the Mississippian refuge. And when assessing Great Bear Lake samples, groups one and group two only, which were the most common morphs in the system, they were also very distinguishable based on this Bayesian clustering. But when we only looked at these group one and group two morphs, the most common ones across all analyses, only assessing these, that differentiation was highlighted even further. Unfortunately, our, our sequencing data were not as informative. Uh, most haplotypes were, were pretty common through most samples and through uh, uh, most morphs. So uh, some follow-up would be needed potentially with different mitochondrial markers to explore this a bit further. So just to summarize uh, this Great Bear Lake work, it's, it's a massive post-glacial system that harbors four morphs of shallow water forms that appear to be weakly but significantly genetically structured. So in general, our study refuted this allopatric hypothesis for the origin of this morphological variation and supported the intralacustrine model where this divergence occurred in situ. So we have provided evidence as well that they came from the Mississippian refuge and perhaps we lend support to an eco-evolutionary in situ model of divergence. And essentially in this paper, we potentially argue a case for ecological speciation. And then the question then becomes, what could be potentially driving or maintaining this difference? And uh, hopefully some upcoming genomics work uh, will shed some light on this. So, uh, I want to end the talk by changing the channel and switching species and uh, highlight some of our recent work that we've done on Arctic char in the Cambridge Bay region of Nunavut. And uh, this is work primarily done with uh, J.S. Moore, who I mentioned previously. 
And uh, the telemetry part of this is in collaboration with the Ocean Tracking Network. But why do we care about char, and especially those in Nunavut? Well, the subsistence harvest of the species has been vital in sustaining the traditional Inuit way of life for millennia. And these subsistence lifestyles remain prominent in contemporary times. Arctic char are a vitally, vitally important food source to Nunavut. It's widely considered the most important fish species in the territory, and it's the most harvested subsistence resource, according to a harvest study from 2004. More recently, it's also been the focus of quite a few commercial fisheries throughout the territory since about the 1960s. And currently there are 100 or roughly uh, commercial and exploratory water bodies distributed throughout the territory with a total available annual quota of around 500,000 kilograms. So this is a pretty important fish species up there. Char are also extremely variable throughout their range, exhibiting multiple life histories or migratory forms, including anadromous, landlocked, and resident forms. And the anadromous individuals are iteroparous, and at high latitudes, they have a really cool life history. So like other salmonids, after they smolt, they migrate to the ocean to take up feeding in marine habitats. However, given the sub-freezing and the lethal temperatures of the ocean during the winter in the Arctic, all Arctic char must return to fresh water every fall, regardless of reproductive conditions, so whether they're going to spawn or not. Therefore, they can stray into non-natal habitats with no potential for gene flow because they aren't spawning in that given year, a phenomenon that JS termed in the paper overwintering dispersal. And presently, Cambridge Bay is home to the largest commercial fishery for the species in Canada. And in fact, the Inunuktun name for the community, Ekelektudiak, directly translates to good place to fish for char. Commercial fishing here commenced in the 1960s at the Freshwater Creek location near the community of Cambridge Bay, but it was quickly moved to the Ekelek River, given concerns of overexploiting this important local resource that was so close to the community. Presently, there are five commercial water bodies uh, that are fished, and since inception of this fishery, over 2.4 million kilograms of Arctic char have been harvested here. In 2014, the Integrated Fisheries Management Plan uh, for this species, or for Cambridge Bay char, was finalized, making it the first of its kind in Canada, which is pretty cool. And the overall goal of this plan really is to ensure the long term sustainability of the Cambridge Bay commercial fishery. Um, we want this resource to be available for generations to come, obviously. An additional main objective within this IFMP is to improve our collective understanding of Arctic char biology, ecology, behavior, and stock discrimination that will help us make informed or better management decisions. And there's now a multidisciplinary research program in the region that strives to do this. So presently, our work in the region is focused around two central themes, and the first aims at collecting those data that can be used in stock assessments. Let's assess sustain sustainability, how healthy are these populations. Second, we conduct uh, research using a variety of methods spanning multiple disciplines that increase our understanding of the biology and ecology of commercially harvested char in this area. And I'm remarkably fortunate to be able to collaborate with such smart and talented folks and, and I feel very blessed and you can see a lot of the names up there that uh, that we work with in the region. And so today I'll just highlight uh, to end this talk off some of our genetic and genomic work and uh, particularly some uh, telemetry work that we combined in there to assess gene flow and dispersal in this system. So using all three of these together we really aim to sort of describe the genetic stock structure of these populations and importantly, inferring the potential demographic independence of these stocks. Um, so this will hopefully allow us to determine when and where these stocks potentially mix, if there's a high de degree of strain, at what scale they should potentially be managed. But the telemetry work on the side also allows us to check out or investigate migration timing, locations, and identify key habitats important for population persistence. So our first initiative was to describe genetic population structure using microsatellite DNA. We focused specifically on commercially harvested Arctic char, and we ran 744 individuals or genotyped them at 18 different loci. And we we're really interested in assessing gene flow and the scale which these populations should be managed. 
So overall, we resolved very moderate but significant structure across the entire, entire study area. But when we included samples just from Cambridge Bay, that structure was much, much weaker and way weaker than in other areas of the Canadian Arctic that we've studied. We did, however, resolve some regional structure that was consistent with management ideas or management groups that were first proposed by Al Christofferson back in the day. And this includes uh, Cambridge Bay or Wellington Bay complex, Albert Edward Bay, and those uh, fisheries on the mainland of Canada. We also performed a Bayesian clustering analysis and structure similar to what we did for Great Bear Lake. And this is a bit of a complicated figure, but really what I want you to notice is the lack of differentiation here between two commercial fishery sites, Eklek and Surrey Rivers, and also just the weak differentiation among the Cambridge Bay stocks in total. So what this study told us is that stocks that are in the Cambridge Bay region are not strongly differentiated Genetic, genetically. And this could be the result of our sampling design. They used commercial fishery samples. So to truly look at stock structure, you'd require individuals or you'd want individuals on spawning grounds, or even better, would be juveniles that have not yet left their natal system. So these would be true genetic baselines. Other reasons, other reasons, so do include potentially high rates of gene flow. Uh, large effective population sizes, and this is not unreasonable, given some of these populations are, are in the hundreds of thousands. And, uh, and because they've colonized this region so recently, there hasn't been enough time for genetic drift to really promote differentiation among these stocks. But it's likely a combination of all these things. So we then analyzed some acoustic data to see if we could shed light onto gene flow and stock mixing in the region, while also providing information on habitats and, and migration timing. But as I mentioned uh, previously, this work is part of the ocean tracking network and uh, that was kind of spearheaded by JS. So since 2013, we've had over 140 acoustic stations spanning both marine and fresh waters, and we've tagged 500 Arctic char now. I'll only discuss a couple of the, the uh, the telemetry findings, as they may help explain some of the microsatellite results. But the first thing that became quite apparent is that all stocks that we tagged mixed extensively together well at sea and at commercial fishing locations, and also after they've returned to overwinter. And so each one of these different colors is a different stock, and each one of the different plots is a different receiver. So you can see we're detecting all these different populations together at uh, different locations. So this could explain that Surrey River and Ekalak River lack of differentiation. So if we were uh, assuming that the Surrey River was a Surrey River stock, but it was actually composed of a bunch of Ekalak River fish, then we would not be able to detect any of those differences. Additionally, the telemetry data revealed extremely high rates of potential straying or movement that was extremely asymmetrical going towards the Ekalak River system. So shown here are three of our tagging locations where fish were followed throughout the marine feeding season. And then they were classified as to whether they went back upstream where they were tagged, highlighted by those black arrows, or whether they went upstream to overwinter and potentially spawn in a different system from which they were tagged. And those are shown here with those red arrows. And you can see that a lot of those fish, even though they were tagged at other locations, are also going up the Ekalak. So we then followed this work up with some genomics work, and our objective was essentially the same as that with the microsatellite DNA assessment, just we wanted finer detail. And we used a RADSEQ approach and ended up with over 6,100 informative SNPs. So once again, we found pretty weak but significant genetic structuring, uh, but each population was somewhat genetically distinct, so a little bit better than microsats. But we were able to identify strays to these systems, and once they were removed, differentiation was much greater and assignment success improved remarkably. We also did some approximate Bayesian uh, computation analyses that suggested gene flow was highly asymmetrical, especially when fish were not in spawning condition. So all told, this suggests that dispersal in the system does not necessarily lead to gene flow. And there may be other uh, factors in play here, and I'll discuss those in a second. But finally, we also found something interesting when we ran initial PCAs of the population structure that revealed these two distinct groups. When we colored those 
by sex, you can clearly see the influence that sex link markers have when you're inferring population structure. So we removed these from the analyses and uh, that painted a much clearer picture of uh, stock structure in the region. So really all together, what this is saying is that Arctic char in the region may, uh, may home to their natal systems in years when they're gonna spawn, but they may opt to overwinter in other places, so rivers with shorter migrations, to minimize the cost of migration in those non-breeding years. And this appears that they're all going in the Ferguson Lake system. Um, also, stocks mix extensively in this area as well. And we did identify a few genes based on uh, outlier, outlier analyses that were associated with uh, muscle and cardiac function, consistent with the hypothesis that uh, migratory harshness could be driving local adaptation. So really in the Cambridge Bay region, there's a lot of gene flow. It can be highly asymmetrical, but it depends on the reproductive condition and stocks mix extensively in this region in both marine and freshwater habitats. And because I, I didn't want to, I kind of mentioned some management and conservation stuff as I was going, uh, but I just wanted to throw up a slide at the end that kind of highlights how genetic or genomic data can be used in conservation and management. So for example, it can be important for identifying units of management below the species level, such as different life history types or groups and populations. It's very important and a, a remarkable tool in resolving contributions to harvest in mixed stock fishery. And we have plans to explore this in the Cambridge Bay region. Um, it's an awesome tool for inferring dispersal and gene flow, which can have implications for something called genetic rescue, if that ever needs to come into play. And there's the effect of population size, which has become a, it's one of the most common parameters reported now in conservation genetics. And this is, uh, there's a 5,500 rule that suggests you need 50 individuals as minimum to avoid inbreeding depression, but then a 500 would be ideal for maintaining long-term population persistence. And this metric is reported throughout the literature nowadays. And so just to end, I want to um, thank the Ekluk Tudiak HTO that is instrumental to the work that we do in the area. Uh, we've been working with them for a long time and we definitely wouldn't be there without them. But more importantly, and I'm not gonna name all these people, we've worked with a lot of people over the years and, and these people help us administratively or more importantly, they keep us live when we're in the field. Some people have to cover the costs. It's not a, not a cheap place to do field work and there's a lot that go into it. So uh, there's a lot of people that need to be acknowledged for our work in the region. And I just wanna throw up this side and say that it's a super bummer and it really sucks not being in the field this year. Uh, this will be my first time in probably almost 20 years that I haven't seen field work in the summer. So I wanted to throw this up to, uh, well, one for nostalgic purposes, but also highlight the crew that we had in our last field season that was pretty amazing. And just to, to bring it full circle, um, yes, those lacustrine and anadromous fish that I went to grad school to study were clearly genetically differentiated. So that was cool. And we did some follow-up work to uh, try to further understand why. And uh, with that, I will throw up some pictures of the reason why JS and I no longer do 70-day field seasons in the Arctic. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in tonight and thank the organizers uh, again for this uh, awesome opportunity. And I'll gladly take any questions. So thank you. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much, Les. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are open for any questions. And while people are thinking of stuff, yes, Matt. He's doing the clapping emoji. <laughs> I'm going to share my own screen real quick just to put up um, our socials. Here we go. Okay, can you guys see the socials page? Maybe, okay. There we go. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it like that. Um, okay, so we have a question. 
What role, if any, do you think glacial lineage plays in contemporary morph formation in Arctic fishes? What role the, do glaciations have in influencing uh, contemporary morphological variation in Arctic fishes? I think so. That sounds right. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. I think it, uh, uh, one, it would depend on, on the degree of isolation and the time that they were separated in these glacial refugia. So was there a lot of time that they might be able to develop these differences? And if so, then then for sure it's it's really important. And then if these ecotypes or morphotypes come back into secondary contact, how long have they been isolated? And is there still the potential for reproductive isolation between them? If there is, then those historical events are gonna be really important and they'll probably still remain differentiated. Uh, but if there is still the potential for gene flow among these different ecotypes or ecomorphs, uh, in contemporary times, and, and then that could kind of erode those differences that I think would have evolved during the during the glacial periods. Thank you. Hope that made sense. Okay, so if nobody else has, I actually have a question. Oh, awesome. Okay, Sarah says that it did answer her question, so well done. Um, this has nothing to do with your research, but uh, okay. I had a question. Um, so if, for example, if I wanted to, to get my foot into the door with DFO, um, what education level would be expected for a permanent uh, position? Uh, anything from a high school diploma all the way up to a, a PhD. And so the, the further up your position, obviously the, the higher the the level of education that you require, so I'm in a position that's known as a as a by three. I think now it would be pretty difficult to to get a by three position without having a master's. And I think when I applied about 11, 12 years ago, now uh, it said that you didn't need a master's, but the master's was an asset qualification. So those that didn't have it would probably get weeded out. Um, but there are technician positions that have two-year uh, technical diplomas. I know people that started a long time ago that don't have any sort of post-secondary education. And of course, there's lots of research scientists now where you would need a uh, you would need a PhD. Wonderful, thank you. Um, okay, we have ooh another couple here. Have you or any colleagues looked at the diet of char stocks in the Cambridge Bay area? and how that might fit into the puzzle of which freshwater systems they are stopping over in during their migrations? Ah, that's a good question. We, we have looked at, at uh, a couple of times, we've looked at stuff in the stomach. So uh, we collected a bunch last year, but unfortunately the, the taxonomic resolution that I was hoping for, uh, didn't get down to very specific levels. So it really wasn't that informative. Um, but the other issue is oftentimes we're, we're collecting these char as they're migrating back upstream to overwinter and, uh, and uh, spend the winter before coming back down the following year. And we work under this assumption that when they're in fresh water, they actually don't feed there anymore once they're adults. And typically before they start migrating upstream, they've also stopped feeding. So we get a lot of char with very, very empty stomachs. And uh, one of the ideas this year, because we're not up there, was to run a community-based sampling program where we could try to sample char throughout the marine feeding season to try to see what they're eating and if there are differences among stocks. So it's a, it's a good question. It's something that we're definitely very interested in. All right, I have another question here that's more about advice. If you could give one piece of advice on how you got to where you are, what would it be aimed at like grad students or like post-secondary sort of? Uh, I, I think my, my number one piece of advice is do not be afraid to email or pick up the phone 
and call people. If you if you read a paper and it's something that you're interested in and you have questions, email that primary author. If you know people work in the building and you have their email addresses, send them emails, introduce yourself, um, ask if there's any opportunities coming up. And I say this because when I finished my, my diploma at Nate, I drove around Edmonton and I, in person, handed out a resume to every single Alberta Conservation Association, biologist, technician, administrative assistant. And I think that, uh, yeah, just contacting people, being persistent and uh, getting your name out there, having your face seen and, and make sure people know who you are. And I think it'll work out. Would you recommend trying to get to conferences while, when you can? A hundred percent. Networking is probably one of one of the most important, but also one of the funnest things that you can do as a grad student. And even if it doesn't uh, kind of can launch you professionally, it's a really great place to to meet people that are like minded, same interests, and uh, yeah, it's just a they're they're awesome. Um, the other recommendation, or one thing that I found really useful when I was in grad school is uh, attend as many of the talks that you can. The uh, journal clubs are really important. I, I like those. And, and you really sort of expand the, the diversity of knowledge that you're going to leave grad school with. Awesome. All right, we have a question more about your experience. Um, I do research on nine spine stickleback in Grenier Lake watershed near Cambridge Bay. I'm sure you're familiar what? with that. Who yes. the heck is this? This is Adam. He's a master's student uh, in the KW area. Based on your experience with Arctic char in the area, do you expect stickleback are a primary food source for char? Um, it, it, I would say probably not. Um, and I say that because once Arctic char smolt, if there are some larger individuals that stick around, say for, for many years before smolting and going to the ocean, and they are feeding voraciously in fresh water, they're, they're just such opportunistic critters that I would be surprised if they didn't pick off some sticklebacks if they got big enough. But as I was mentioning, we kind of work under this assumption that once they are adults and they've gone to the ocean for the first time, when they return to fresh water to overwinter, uh, we really don't think that they're feeding again until they bounce back to the ocean the next year. So it's, wow. a, good, it's a really good question. And if you kept any char there with sticklebacks in your stomach, let us know. Well, Adam would know because I know he's looking at, uh, well, he's looking at fish stomachs. So I'm not sure about char. Um, okay, so we have one more question here. How typical is your role as a by three? Is it common for by threes to do as much much research outside of stock assessment as you do? Uh, yeah, I I think so. Um, I mean, I yeah, I do probably do a little bit more research than the than the common by three, but um, I think that we all have the opportunity to. And I'm thinking about all my sort of cohort that started at the same time. As long as we are able to get the stock assessment work done we have a lot of flexibility to sort of guide some of the other questions that we're really interested in. So um, I think that uh, a by three is almost a little bit of a sweet spot. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are at time. That was perfect. We got to all the questions that were posed. Uh, thank you again, Les. Um, amazing <laughs> first guest. I really appreciate your time. And Thanks, yeah, thank, thank you everyone for attending and we will see you again. Um, make sure to follow along. We have our socials up on the screen right now. Uh, we will be posting who our next guest is and when we're gonna be doing that soon. So thanks again. Bye everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone, bye.